on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by First Fidelity Bank. Bob Stoops joins us to talk about his career and being selected to the College Football Hall of Fame. And he tells some great stories that y'all are going to love. We've got the latest OU football updates, including a big potential transfer having OU in his final three in the National College Football Roundup, bringing you the latest college football news, including who Steve Zarkeesian is adding to his staff at Texas. We give you our winners and losers of the weekend, NFL Divisional Playoffs edition, and finish with the return of football guys talking basketball, FGTB. Let's go. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. I mean, Michael Hostie will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, January 18th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by First Fidelity Bank. First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs. Checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more, they do it all. Whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone, everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank also provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank at First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. Now we're recording this on Sunday night, and we've got Bob. Bob. Coach Stoops, we've got him, Ted. And I, I don't want to – I don't think – I'm exaggerating when I think it's maybe the best interview he's ever done. I think it's great. I mean, uh, sometimes you, I, if you're in it, doing it, you've got a different feeling uh, than an outside observer with the interview. But gosh, I thought it was fantastic. I learned some things that I didn't know. I, you know, I've, I've heard coach talk about a story a million times and coming to OU a million times, but to pick up new nuggets like that, I, I thought was awesome. He was totally comfortable, relaxed. It was fun. Yeah. So uh, I think you guys are all going to really enjoy that. And don't forget, uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, to leave us a five-star review and leave us a comment. Let us know who you want us to try to get on the podcast now that football season or the college football season is over and the NFL season is winding down. We're going to try to get some more guests on here. And we already got a few suggestions. Teddy, uh, one listener w- would like for us to try and get Brad Pitt. Yeah. Seems easy. Okay. I mean, I, yeah, it seems he's an Oklahoman. I get it, but I like, know. that's it's, maybe we should start somewhere a little lower than like the most famous guy on the planet. And here's the other thing is, you know, I know this is a podcast, but we also have video on YouTube. I'm, I mean, let's not throw ourselves up there with one of the uh, best looking men of all time. He's gorgeous. Okay? He, he would make us look <laughs> like scum. Oh, <laughs> yeah. How about we don't? All right, let's get to the local college football stuff. And that's brought to you by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience. There are temperature screenings at all entrances and masks are required for all patrons and employees because your safety is Riverwind's number one priority. There are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including blackjack, blackjack match, roulette, and craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. For January's kitchen cash-in, all wildcard members that earn 500 points on GCG machines will win an Emerald Legacy knife set. Bam! Ah. Look at Riverwind kick it up a notch, Ted. If you need help finding a way, just visit riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the one. Okay, a few pieces of OU news. How'd you like the Riverwind? That, that, that's the first time uh, we've done that read. That's pretty good. That's pretty great. good, huh? All and, right, uh, let's... I, can, I can vouch. They do have craps now, baby. They do have craps. Ted Lehman, big craps guy. Big <laughs> craps on that Ted Lehman guy. 
wait, what? Okay, OU news. Uh, let's start here. So, an exciting possibility, right? Uh, Tennessee offensive tackle, Wanya Morris, is officially in the transfer portal, and he's even come out and announced his top three, and OU made the cut along with Texas A&M and USC. Uh, this is a kid that was a five-star recruit coming out of high school. OU recruited him extremely hard. In I in high school, he's six five three twenty. Now certainly looks the part. Played a lot of games for Tennessee. Uh, been you know going back and watching a little Tennessee to see kind of what he's got. And this kid's really talented. That he's he's really talented. He's played some games in the SEC. So uh, I mean he's played against some really good players. But Beanbow going hard after this kid. And we've talked about this before at, at every position for the Sooners. You can't have too much talent. You cannot create too much competition in a room. You just can't. And this is a guy that OU certainly wants to bring in. Yeah. And I'll tell you what I love is I think that 6'5", 320 is about the perfect number for a tackle. Um, you know, 6'5", is tall enough, long enough, you start getting – any bigger than that, in my opinion, you may think differently. It gets harder to bend and get down, especially in college after some of those smaller age guys. Uh, if you get too big, too heavy, you know, it's easy to sit down and anchor, but can you run? Can you get out in some of the zone stuff? Can you pull like Bill likes those guys to do in, in our gap stuff? Perfect size. He's athletic. So I, I, that would be a great addition because I like who we've got coming back now. I don't know where all those guys are going to end up, like what what position everyone's going to end up being slotted in, but I think we can end up finding a, a really good final five, and if he's here, that just ups the game. It, it just makes it that much better. So I'm all for it. Hopefully, uh, you know, the, the transfer portal has been interesting for Oklahoma. We've obviously benefited some uh, at the quarterback position, but uh, we've lost guys, too. We lost Trey Sermon, and that hurt. But it'd be nice to gain a tackle. That'd be two guys on our offensive line that we got from the portal, so that would be pretty good. When, when you talk about premium positions in college football, clearly it all starts with quarterback, right? Everyone realizes that. And football in general, right, it's quarterback and getting to the quarterback. So that makes pass rushers extremely important and offensive tackles this is a position that you, you can't be too talented at it. Like you can't have too many good players. And when you look at this kid's physical characteristics, like you're right, Ted, this kid looks the part. He looks exactly how you want your offensive tackles to look. And I agree with you. When you talk about the size, I like my tackles about six, four, six, five, but with like a six, eight wingspan or mm -hmm. the longer arms, the better, but this, this would be a big get. It would be, it would add talent and depth to the room. This kid would start right away at Oklahoma. Now, Bill Biedenboe, he's he's not going to hand this kid anything, right? He's going to have to earn it. But the proposition of this kid coming in, being able to, to play probably left tackle, just putting Anton Harrison over there on the right side, which is something he did in high school, something he's very comfortable with doing, uh, that, that seems like the best case scenario. So uh, I know Texas A&M, Lost a lot of guys off that O-line, so uh, there's a lot of snaps to be replaced there as well. I understand that. So we'll see, but I, I don't feel like USC is really in the mix there. I mean, it's all the way I, – I get it, I guess. But it's a you know historic program, but this is a kid that's from the state of Georgia. I, I really don't know why he would want to go to USC. It seemed to, In my mind – it seems to be down to OU and Texas A&M, but I, I'm not going to pretend I know a lot about this kid, like personally, but it, it seems like if you want to be an offensive lineman and go play in the league, OU and Texas A&M are two of the, you know, three or four top places to play in college football right now. Yeah, those are the, I mean, gosh, if you over the last, you know, what, eight years or so, you look at those two programs, Oklahoma and Texas a and m they've put out some big-time offensive linemen uh, between the two. So, yeah, I, I mean, USC seems strange. I think a and is probably going to be the, the, the real conversation there. And, you know, if 
if you're just looking at like timing, the timing is perfect at Oklahoma. I, obviously, a and the program is clicking up and doing things right, coming off a really, really nice year. Going to be trying to replace a quarterback. And, you know, I, I don't know what the timing necessarily is like at, at A&M, but I know at Oklahoma, the timing's perfect. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that is uh, part of that recruiting pitch from Lincoln Riley and Bill Bean, but we'll see. Uh, that'll be big if they can get Wanya Morris. Uh, one more thing for OU football. ESPN came out with a list of breakout players uh, for the top five teams, and they're way too early top 25. And, Teddy, they've got your man, David Aguebu, as the breakout player for OU in 2021. I know you love that guy. He showed a lot of his versatility this year, being able to play that Mike Backer spot, but also – being in some of those rush packages, using that length, uh, using, you know, what he learned prior on as an edge player there in the interior, did some really good things in that package. And I, I, I agree with ESPN. I, I think next year could be a huge year for Aguebu. Oh, I agree hundred percent. I think that a, it's tough to make a transition. I've talked about this a million times. I'm sorry, but it's tough to move from, an outside position on the line of scrimmage to an inside backer off the ball. It's incredibly difficult. It's two different worlds. There's almost zero carryover between the two spots and your vision is, is totally different. Um, I thought he was fantastic making that transition in an abnormal year, not getting a spring, not getting your typical summer, to be able to do what he did and play at such a high level this year, I thought was great. Now, he did not reach his capabilities, in my opinion, but he shouldn't. He's a sophomore, and it's his first year. You know, if he had capped out right there, I'd be worried about it. I think the sky's the limit. And knowing the role, having all those snaps, being able to, to dedicate an entire offseason to learning and growing at that position, I think next year – he, he should have a phenomenal year. And I think inside backer for Oklahoma is going to be a phenomenal year. We're going to have four, five guys that I feel like can compete for starting positions. I don't know what the final combination is going to be. Remember, we're getting Caleb Kelly back. We got a Guaybu, uh, still have Deshaun White, Osamoa, and Shane Witter, in my opinion, is right there in the fire as well. So, We've got an embarrassment of riches at the inside backer spot right now. Yeah, and no one looks better in a jersey than a Guaybu. My goodness. Yep. First right. team, All-American off the bus team. My goodness, does that kid look good in a jersey? Okay, Ted, let's move on to Call Your Shot, and that's brought to you by Rock and Roll Tequila. Rock and Roll Tequila is the ultra-premium tequila that hits all the right notes. It's won all kinds of awards for its superior taste and smooth finish. To find a store that has it, visit rockandrolltequila.com or check out their Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. This stuff is good. If you don't want to take my word for it, maybe you'll listen to this guy. This is Coach Bob Stoops. When you're a college football coach, it's important to have an eye for talent. The same holds true when choosing your tequila. When I tried rock and roll, I liked it so much, I decided to become a partner in this Oklahoma-owned company. Crafted in the highlands of Jalisco, Mexico, the smooth taste of rock and roll's triple distilled platinum, our Añejo, called Cristalino, and the incredible premium quality mango tequila are awesome. Our defiantly unique guitar-shaped bottles make it easy to find, and you'll love the ultra-premium quality and taste. No excuses. Make rock and roll your game day tequila. Tastefully rebellious, start the party with rock and roll. And we asked you for the most important thing that happened for OU football this week. And our favorite came from Jason Moore at JMOU13 on Twitter. And Jason says, keeping Dennis Simmons. Now, Jason, once again, we addressed this on the last episode. Dennis Simmons wasn't going anywhere. He, he was not. I, I know there was reports out there that said that Steve Sarkeesian would target, to, target him to bring him to Texas. It wasn't going to work. It simply wasn't going to work. Dennis Simmons is loyal to Lincoln Riley, and Lincoln Riley is loyal to Dennis Simmons. Like, if Dennis, Dennis Simmons got some sort of unbelievable offer from Texas, Lincoln Riley would do everything in his power to match that offer 
at Oklahoma. He's been fantastic developing those outside wide receivers, right, Ted? I mean, he's just he's been a great member of this staff. And I, I don't think he was ever even considering going anywhere else. Well, why would he? I mean, you could convince me that he may have considered leaving if it was for an offensive coordinator position, right? Um, and I don't know, maybe that was discussed. Uh, he'd be offensive coordinator in title and Sarkeesian would be the actual play caller. I mean, maybe that would happen, but I mean, I know there was rumor of connection, but outside of the two guys playing together 25 years ago um, on different sides of the ball at BYU, I don't know what other, I mean, that a that's deep, not a deep connection was established. <laughs> not much of a connection. So I, I can't tell you that there wasn't some discussion going on there. I have no idea, but, Keeping him was big. Uh, he is awesome at, at that role at Oklahoma, does a really good job recruiting. So I'll say that I agree that I'm glad that he's here. I, I, I We completely agree with you, Jason. <laughs> also, Jason, do me a favor. Go look at the outside receivers for Texas and look at the outside receivers Oklahoma <laughs> has right now. Uh, yeah, I think Dennis Simmons got to be here for a long time, but you know, never know if we'll get a coordinator position. I don't even know if he wants to be a coordinator. You know, some guys just like being a position coach, but who knows? Don't know Dennis's ambitions, but damn glad he is a member of the Oklahoma staff. Now, one piece of Oklahoma State football news, Christian Holmes announced that he was coming back. This is a classic example of a guy that did not need to put out a graphic, Teddy. It, we didn't need a Christian Holmes graphic saying he was coming back. I mean, what was the other option? He had 24 tackles this season. Now, I, I, he's a decent player, right? He wears zero. That's kind of cool, but he didn't have any interceptions. Had a couple of pass breakups. Like, wh what am I missing? Why th Does everyone have to put a graphic out now? Is that is that the rule? I guess. I honestly don't know. This is – I'm, I'm – fairly social media savvy fairly i'm not a high level but i can at least navigate this is one of the things that i don't understand i in because i try and put myself in in their shoes and th this is the reason i didn't have a draft party okay i don't want to look like an idiot that's my main goal in life is to not look like an idiot okay and Whenever you put out a graphic, whenever you're not a player that is receiving any type of high marks or would be drafted in the first, second, third, fourth round, when you put out a graphic, the first thing that happens is comment number one. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, what's the other option? Not getting drafted into the NFL. I mean, my whole goal is to try and keep those things from happening so I can't wrap my head around these type of moves. Uh, speaking from experience, uh, having a draft party and going undrafted, not a ton of fun, not a ton of fun. Just so, oh. uh, just so you know, but it was catered for free by my friends at Olive Garden. Shout out to the Olive Garden oh, for that. Man. Made a, made a bad that. night better. You guys made a bad night better with all those bread, bread sticks. Shout out to Olive Garden. <laughs> all right, Ted, let's get to the interview with Bob, uh, I, we think it is, it's really, really good. And it was, it was really cool to talk to some of, uh, to talk to coach about some of these things. And this interview is brought to you by Insurica. Do you own a business? If you do, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your best business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back total control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client and you should be too. 
If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. All right, here he is. First ballot college football hall of famer, Bob Stoops. It is our pleasure to be joined by our coach. He is a first ballot. Yes, I said first ballot college football hall of famer. Bob Stoops is in the house. Coach, hey. what is going on, my man? Hey, Gabe, good to see you, buddy. Always great to see my players. Good to see Teddy out there as well. So, uh, you know, it, this whole journey, there's nothing better than the players. As you guys know, I always love my players. And I got the biggest joy, I think, out of just being around the guys, uh, you players, every single day. Now, I think it's awesome, Gabe. We could say we're coached by a Hall of Famer. That I, I was already saying that, like, you <laughs> right. know, but it, it's official now. I, I think we all knew where this was headed. Now, Coach, I, I did want to start with uh, you getting the call, right? What, what was that like? Uh, where were you? How did you react? Give us all the details because that, that had to be a surreal moment. <laughs> well, actually, I, uh, I got the call from Steve Hatchell, the president, that he wanted to visit with me, and he had good news. Well, that was on my voicemail while I was out of Cabo del Sol golfing on the 10th hole. <laughs> <laughs> so I was with, uh, I was actually with Toby uh, Keith. We were out golfing. And I said, hey, Big T, I think I might be getting in the Hall of Fame. They, they said they had good news for me. Uh, so I waited till I got back, uh, uh, back to our condo down there uh, where Carol and I were staying to call him uh, so that she was with me when I gave him the call. That's awesome. I mean, I, I know um, accolades and stuff like that have, have never been your focus, but when you you think back to whenever you first got started, GAN, uh, low-level assistant, I mean, I'm sure it was a grind. And to think back to those days and to think to, to where you've come and, and making the Hall of Fame, it's got to be pretty special. Yeah, it really is. Um, I, I uh, feel incredibly blessed. No question from playing career at Iowa, the friends I've made there, and then my young coaching career there and moving from Kent to, to Kansas State to Florida. You know, I feel like God just blessed me along the way. And I've never had a, uh, it's not like I ever set out to have a path. I always knew I loved coaching. It was, I always felt, even though the young years of how hard it all was, even my later years, it's always a grind to go through the season and to win and to be successful. But I never felt like I was working. I always felt like it was fun. It was enjoyable. And it, it never felt like work, uh, even though our crazy hours, uh, you know, the like they are, we, we put in, you know, 16, 17 hours a day, a bunch of times, you know. Uh, but anyway, um, you know, so it was, it was just a steady climb. And I, I think really the biggest break in my life was getting that opportunity to play at Iowa because of the playing career it started. And then, uh, you know, uh, my two brothers end up playing there. I get to play in the Rose Bowl as a junior. We win the Big Ten championship. Um, you know, just those kind of special moments. And then the, the great coaches from Hayden Fry to Bill Brazier, Dan McCartney, Barry Alvarez, Bill Snyder, Kirk Ferentz. It goes on and on and on. I was around the best leaders, coaches, mentors, any young coach could ever ask for. So I, I learned a ton from all of them. So anyway, it's just, it was a long journey, but an incredibly special and fun one. That's, that's for sure. Now, coach, a lot of people, you know, they see the success you had at Oklahoma, but I definitely want to touch on your playing days because you mentioned that being the lifetime, uh, the opportunity of a lifetime, right? How, how do you think, being a player and going through those experiences, how do you think that helped you as a coach? How do you think it helped you relate to the guys? Like, do you think you're, you being a player and doing all those things, you know, everything that is tough about college football, do you think that helped you be a better coach? I think it just helps you grow as a man, as a person, to be a competitor and, and to play at that level. You know, the emotion, the, the, uh, the intensity, the fight and the struggle it takes or to walk in the huddle when you're absolutely exhausted and it's third down and you know, you gotta, you gotta step up and make a play, you know, you gotta fight through it. And, and, and anyway, all of that stuff, I just help think it really builds you as a, as a person, as a man, as a competitor. 
And, and when you go through that for a long period of time, again, and, and the relationships it builds, you know, with guys that are doing it right next to you. And you, you just have such a, a, an appreciation for them and a respect for them. Some of my best friends to this day are, to this day are guys I was on the field with way back in the, you know, the late seventies and early eighties uh, when I played, uh, finished in 82. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I just think the being out there in that competition, in that struggle, really it, in a lot of ways builds you. You grew up in a, a household, obviously, uh, with a coach. And so did you know from an early age that that's what you wanted to get into? Or did you get done playing and like, oh, my God, what am I going to do now? I guess I'll I'll try and continue on here at Iowa. Or is that did you have it in your mind that that's what you wanted to do? I really didn't as a youngster, but I don't know that I could have done anything else. We talked, I might, I'm one of six kids. So my dad would take us, whoever wanted to come with them to whatever baseball game he was playing in football game. He was practicing, coaching and practicing and basketball games. He would score, keep and referee on the weekends, wherever he went, it was a field or a court or a, you know, some kind of competition. So that's all we were ever around. And then, you know, then I, I go through college and I'm graduating my last year, spring. I had just gone through the interviews at the student union, like when they bring in all the companies and you bring your resume that you type up. And I had a tie, a, a shirt and tie that wouldn't, my shirt wouldn't buck, button. You guys know I had that football neck. That's right. <laughs> so, Eddie still so has my, that my, neck. My, my tie was kind of just barely holding my shirt together. So I go to a couple interviews, I think it was Coca-Cola and Procter and Gamble. And, and I'm sitting in these interviews and I'm thinking, what in the heck am I doing? I'm not going to sit behind a desk my whole life or you know, not that they would have even hired me, but anyhow, I go back to the football office after my interviews and uh, Dan McCarney and Barry Alvarez are there, you know, they're kind of like my guys and they start laughing at me and they go, what in the heck are you doing dressed up like that? <laughs> So they, and I told them I was interviewing for some jobs and they started laughing. They said, you don't need to be going to any interviews. You need to just stay here with us and be a coach. <laughs> so that's when it really kind of hit me. I said, really, I can, I can do that. And they're like, well, you know, of course we'll talk to coach Fry. And, and uh, sure enough, that's how it started. Then I, once I graduated, I became a graduate assistant and then the volunteer coach. So for five years, I didn't make hardly any money. I think my parents were wondering if I was ever going to get a job. So um, anyhow, that's how it went. I didn't have a full-time job till, you know, coach until I was 28. Now I, I've read your book. I think everyone should read your book. It's great. It's called no excuses. Go buy it people. But I, you, you talk a lot about your coaching influences, right? And you touched on it earlier, but Hayden Fry at Iowa, uh, Dick Crum there, Kent State, uh, Bill Snyder, of course, at K-State and, and Steve Spurrier at Florida. Like along the journey, did you gather bits and pieces from each one of those guys? W was it more like X's and O's? Was it more management style? Like, is that something that you were thinking about when you were in it? Oh, sure. You just naturally pick up things from people you're around, or you know, especially when you're around them for a, a long time. So naturally, uh, yes, I picked up you know, different qualities from all of them. One that's never mentioned enough was my defensive back coach and my coordinator at Iowa, my defensive back coach and coordinator, Bill Brazier, was really the, the one that had the strongest early influence on me because he, he, I was a GA for him and I'd come up with ideas or I'd always asking him questions on why, why, why. And he would show me, he had the patience to show me or he'd tell me, well, that's such a good idea you have. Get up on the board and show them, show it to me. And I'm just like, okay, I got to get up on the chalkboard. We had chalk back in those days and, uh, you know, show them what I was thinking about. And, and anyway, so he really had a major influence on my strategy as a defensive coach and, and why and, and really helped me, you know, understand and get started, uh, you know, defensively with, with all that was happening and why we were doing things. And then of course, the finishing, I think the finishing product was of course, Steve Spurrier had a huge impact on me. And, and that was the polishing up, you know, there the last three years with him uh, was really special at Florida. And I learned a ton from him as well on the competition part of it, enjoying it, um, 
you know, you're, you're managing your family time and your work time and, uh, you know, all of that together, he was a major influence to me. That's so it's gotta be cool to, you know, as you went through that, you started as a GA there and as a volunteer assistant and obviously worked your way up and, you know, coach Fry's tree of coaches is just amazing, but you've got to take some, some pride in your tree because you had a lot of guys do that exact same thing. I think about like uh, when, when I was a senior, uh, Seth, the trail was a student assistant and That's now right. he's a head coach and just a bunch of different guys that kind of took your same path under you and to watch those guys grow and develop. I mean, you obviously the stuff on the field is, is something to be proud of, but watching the, you, the people under your influence grow and, and have a lot of success has to be special. It was fun to see those guys. I always wanted to see my assistants become head coaches. And we had a lot of them. I mean, from my first year, Mike Leach, and then I think Mark Mangino, uh, uh, Chuck Long, Mike Stoops was at Arizona for eight years. Um, Kevin Sumlin, um, Ke Kevin Wilson uh, went to Indiana. So, I mean, we, we had a lot of guys. I'm probably missing someone, Seth Luttrell. Um, and, and then in my years, I mean, Jay Norvell is now oh, head coach. Oh, Jay Norvell also. Um, uh, Hype, coach. now a head coach. Uh, Josh Hype, now a head coach. So we've, gosh, that's probably two hands full, uh, you know, when you look at it. <laughs> Pretty uh, damn good. <laughs> that have become head coaches you know, from, you know, from, from out of our building. Yeah. Now, Coach, th there's something that comes up a lot now when uh, a guy is going from coordinator to head coach. And there's kind of this great debate in college football now of, hey, should he stay on as the play caller? Should he continue to be that guy, right? You see that with, you know, that discussion happened with Sarkeesian taking the Texas job this week. W was that something that you struggled with when, when you went from the defense coordinator there on a national championship team in Florida and, and you take over the OU job was, I, I know you were still heavily involved in the defense, but was that a hard transition being less hands-on? No, only because, uh, because Mike and Brent were with me and they were running the same defense. We were running Florida and Kansas state, you know, and Brent and Mike were both with me for a good number of years at Kansas state. So I knew, you know, when I was in those meetings as well, so I knew what we were doing and um, you know, so had it not been those guys that I had such a history with, you know, with it being in my, our same defense that I was used to doing, then I probably would have, um, you know, so I, I, there's a lot of guys that do. I mean, coach Spurrier's called his plays all those years. I mean, look what Lincoln's doing. And, and when you're so good at it, can you really give it to somebody else? You know, that's, it's, um, and I think it's, it's probably a little bit easier to give to someone else when it's defense, because you can be in those meetings, you could help set up the blitzes or, you know, set up what you want your front and, you know, how you're going to play certain things. But I think it, the question comes more offensively. And I, I think the guys like watching uh, Steve Sarkeesian, uh, his way they played at, at Alabama and his play calling, I don't know why he would. Well, I guess if he's coming to Texas, I hope he gives it up. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> good point. Yeah, but anyway, because he's, he's really good at it, uh, as is Lincoln and you know, the guys that really have a have a knack for it, I don't know why you would give it up. That's part of the reason you've become a head coach. Well, you mentioned Sarkeesian, and, you know, with the success that Alabama's had, Coach Saban constantly has to rehire new coordinators. And we just talked about the list of guys that, you know, turned into head coaches off of your staff. What was that like, you know, whenever you have success, obviously those, those people are going to grow and people are going to want to, to poach off your staff. How, how difficult was it to always find good quality hires out there and, and people that you could trust in your program? Well, I, I think all us coaches pay attention around the country who's doing well. And you kind of always, whether you write it down or not, you always got about three, four or five guys in the back of your mind that you kind of the way you've been watching them, you may not even know them or you may know them. And you're like, boy, they really, they've really got it going on. They're, they're playing well and, and you like their style and what they're doing. So I think, you know, you're, you're always kind of have your little playbook of guys that you, you, you kind of want to go to if things are, 
you know, it, it, when you do lose a guy and, um, you know, that, that's, you know, that's kind of what you do as a head coach. You can't always have in the back of your mind, certain, certain coaches, you know, you'd, you'd, you, you like the way they, they coach and you like what they're doing on the field. Now uh, I've heard Saban talk about this though, when you would lose a guy and he'd become a head coach, what was it like making it clear that that guy couldn't take the rest of your guys, if that makes sense. Cause you, you still have your staff in place. And it seems like that could be a bit of an awkward situation sometimes. Yeah. But you know, in the end, we're all professionals. If that's better for that guy's family and you got a better situation, then, Hey, you know, none of us own anybody at the end of the day, if that's better for him, have at it, you know, go, then I, I, you, you, you go ahead and, and we're all big boys. We all figure out what we've got to do. But I, I don't recall any, anyone really saying, oh, you can't take somebody. At the end of the day, if you, you feel that you, get, you pay them more money or it's a better situation for their family or maybe the area of the country they're living in, if it's better for them, then hey, hey by all means, you know, as a pro, that's what you're supposed to do. Take, you know, just move on. And, and, uh, and that's just part of our profession. Rarely is there a better situation than Oklahoma. So I think that, <laughs> you know, you, you don't really have to deal with that a whole lot. Um, are, you are you happy with the current state of college football, with, with what you see, with the way the game is played and any of the stuff going around it? I mean, it seems to be a, a, a thriving sport, but gosh, from whenever you played to whenever you started coaching to where it is now, I mean, there's been so much that's changed. Well, I don't know. I think the, the one obvious, especially this time of year, is the transfer portal. And, um, you know, no one cares what I think about it. Shoot, I've been out four years now, so it doesn't much matter. Um, so in the end, um, that's that's kind of different now that, you know, guys are moving around all over the place. And and I don't, I don't know that that's great for everyone, but, uh, but uh, it, you know, you're not, you can't put the ketchup back in the bottle, that's for sure. So it's, it is, that's where it's at right now. And now it's just something you deal with and, you know, let's face it though. And in some positive ways, heck it's been good for us. Some of the transfer quarterbacks, obviously, you know, have worked great for us. And, um, you know, and I, I've always, I think initially it was put in place for guys that graduated and say like a Trevor Knight, he's playing behind a younger guy, you know, like, Hey, this is good for him. And I was happy as any, I was the happiest guy in the building when I knew Trevor had a great spot to go to and play and, but now it's morphed into this. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's just the way it is. Freshman, sophomore, junior year to get them to sign, you got to recruit them while they're with you, you know, to keep it, you know, to keep them with you. How yeah. many games would you got kicked out of at Iowa for targeting all of them? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's, there's quite a few. <laughs> Pull up the one, uh, I guess it would have been 1979, Iowa versus Purdue. And I, I've, I've got, I broke a guy's jaw in two places and his whole jawbone was turned upside down. And I was, <laughs> I was out on my feet before I even hit the ground. So, wow. <laughs> so anyway, there, there was quite a few, but that, no, no one ever thought about, no one, there was never any talk of targeting back in those days. Now, Coach Teddy and I, we, we were both part of it, but uh, the success you had at OU, right? 14 double-digit win seasons, 10 Big 12 titles, national championship in 2000. You played in three others, but when you look back on it, uh, what do you think allowed you to be so successful at Oklahoma? A um, bunch of things. I've said it a lot. You know, in this game, the ultimate team sport. No one does it alone. So I had, you know, great support from my administration, uh, Joe Castiglione on up through President Bourne, and then um, great support around me in the building, assistant coaches and support staff, medical staff, just really solid people, Every, you know, and, um, and then ultimately, too, I, I, I felt like I always related well to my players or had a good pulse for what my, the players needed and, and what their attitude was and how to push you and, and get more out of you, but still enjoy it, still have fun, you know? So, uh, you know, I, I think as much as anything relating to the players at the end too, was a, was a major part of us being able to be successful. You, you know, it's well-documented that 
whenever uh, the respect you had for Oklahoma, um, sleeping giant up here, whenever you were at Florida and, and um, decided to, you know, take that phone call and, and take that leap. What, what was that process like? H- had you been fielding offers for a couple of years from, from different people or was this like the first thing that came and it's like, Oh my God, it's Oklahoma. How, how did that whole process work out and kind no, of that decision-making going into it? I had a couple of major schools in my first year at Florida after we had won the na- uh, national championship in 96, there were uh, a couple that really, you know, uh, were after me. And I, I just thought, you know, I didn't feel that they fit me really well. Uh, and I, I felt I, you know, I was young enough think at the time I was 35 when the first one came around and I was like, you know what? And coach Spurrier, you know, we were close and he goes, you know, Bobby thinking about it though. He goes, look, he goes, we're not going bad. I mean, we're going to continue to be really good. He goes, and if these don't fit you, wait for something that really fits you and you know, that you feel great about. And, and I said, you know, and I thought about it for a day and I said, you know, he's absolutely right. Why do I need, and truth be told, I wanted to be around them longer. I wanted to learn more from them and, and I did. And so I put it off. And then sure enough that after my third season, uh, now it's two that really fit me, Iowa and Oklahoma within a day of each other want to talk to me and meet me, you know? And, and so now the whole ball started to roll, you know? And I was like, okay, I can't say no to these two, <laughs> you know? So this is, this is what I've been waiting for. I remember watching the year before in the locker room, pretty early game, I, uh, Oklahoma was getting beat by Northwestern, like 21 nothing. And I come in from a scrimmage or something at Florida we hadn't played yet. And I, you know, I said to the coaches right there, because they were the big eight, big eight, big 12 guys. I said, you know what, guys? I said, that is a crying shame. I said, that is a sleeping giant right there. And there's been too many years they haven't been doing anything. And, and I remember saying it specifically. And then a year later, you know, I'm on the phone with them. That, that's so interesting that you say that, like when, when you got to OU, right. And you made it clear, like, Hey, you, it, it was all about putting the work in, but what were the biggest changes you implemented that you think turn that, turn the program around so quickly? I, I think uh, changing our mindset, we had a very low self-esteem guys when I first got here. Cool. They had been beat down, um, earning it, earning it, putting in the work, you know, and, um, and, 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 you know, the, it takes no talent to play hard, be tough and, and be smart, play smart. So that was our motto all the time. I mean, how can we play as efficiently as we can play hard and be tough? And if we do those things more so than the other team, we're going to win more than we don't. And that's like what happened the first year. And, but it was, you know, it was Smitty uh, giving us a mindset. And I think our guys realized, man, we worked too hard here to go out here and not win. I mean, this has been a grind. Um, you know, these guys totally, I mean, you, you, they couldn't make it through our first week, you know, when we started running them and training them. They, there were guys falling out left and right. In, in those first few days and first week. And, but then, then they started to realize they can do it. They were doing it and we started to build. And then, and then that, that, that starts to build confidence. And, um, and then you got a mindset of like, I, like I said, we're, we work too hard to go out here and lose. You know, this is, this is what we're gonna do. And I think they had a lot of faith in us coaches that we, we had come from successful programs. So we weren't, we weren't telling telling our guys to do something that we haven't seen win and be successful somewhere else. No, I, I I always talk about that too. You know the the fact that you come in and you put a, a brutal amount of work in, and then you go out there and it translates to success on the field. And I think that that early success put the foundation down that this is how it's done. This is the process of winning. It sucks. It's brutal, but this is the process. So. How, guys, how important if it was easy everybody be winning right that, that isn't how it works i mean right. yeah that's right so I, I, how important is it whenever you see all these you know coaches taking over new programs how important is it to have that success pretty quickly 
for guys to say, okay, yeah, this makes sense. I'll, I'll buy into this. Like if it's not first one or two years, you feel like maybe there's a sense of losing the players a little bit in that process. Well, in today's, today's world, it's a little bit that way. Everybody wants a quick fix or there's very little patience out there. So, um, you know, and I helped create that atmosphere by winning it all in the second year. So, uh, <laughs> So anyway, I was, anyhow, it's, you know, you, you just, you, you do need to win quickly though. Um, and I think most places you can, yeah, well, I've done the right way. And I, you know, I felt we, we really turned the corner that first year in 99 homecoming game playing Texas A&M. They had been beating the heck out of Oklahoma. They had, uh, they had been the, the big 12 champs the year before. And uh, we had them at home. And we beat them like 51 to six or seven. And that to me is when we really, because our guys, we told them this is it now. So we're not taking this from A&M anymore. They had been kicking, beating us bad. And I said, we're, you know, this is our homecoming. We're going, we need to make the, make a point right here. And, and we come out and made a, and may had a great game. The, uh, I assume uh, the national championship game really stands out as one of the top memories, but it seems like you remember just about every game coach. So do you have, you know, three or four that really stand Maybe. out to you when it comes oh, yeah. to your OU career? You know, yes. Uh, that, the, the, uh, 2000 Nebraska at home, uh, where we're down 14, nothing, the first two drives. Then we go on a 31 unanswered points and fans, you know, never seen the place that way, how electric it was. And, and then I was yelling, stormed. I was in the stands, baby, let's go. <laughs> you probably stormed the field with everybody else. And, but that's a, you know, that's a, that, that run through, um, you know, that run through uh, uh, Texas, uh, K-State and Nebraska, all straight three in a row. And the way we played is, you know, was really special because then you knew, well, you really knew we were good, you know, it was like, okay, we're, we're going to keep this going. And then all those years through the years, um, you know, a bunch of the Texas games, uh, of course, are always special. Uh, you know, not, not just the, the big scores like everyone talks about. I love the 12 to nothing where we sacked Vince Young like eight times. You know, that, that was a, a, an exciting, fun one. Because because it's just, you don't win very often 12 to zero. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it just, uh, just the way it happened. Um, and then all the big, you know, the big 12 championship games as well are always neat, especially kind of playing Nebraska and, and a few of them when, you know, when with that rivalry and meeting in the, in the big 12 championship, I, we, I think one of them was uh, the first in Kansas city was really neat. And, uh, Paul Thompson brought us off the one yard line uh, to go down and score and really kind of go up three, you know, 21 to seven, I think it was. And then we, uh, and then playing them in AT and T Stadium, the first Big Twelve championship game played down there, I thought was really neat too. So a bunch of them. There's there's so many, you know. You know, one of the things is, you know, we always talk about the football and uh, the championships, and obviously you had a ton of great players and put a bunch of guys into the NFL. But uh, I know it was also really important that you got to see a bunch of guys graduate and um, come from some bad situations uh, here and there, but to see a bunch of kids see it through to graduating uh, from the University of Oklahoma was, was always a big thing for you. Absolutely. Um, that, you know, that not everyone's going to play, you know, pro football at all. So, you know, there's, it's a small percentage, but to, but to graduate and to have these connections, graduate from OU and have all the connections and the, you know, you know, to keep those through the years, you know, can can really help a guy, you know, you know, find a great way in life in, in, a, in you know, in, in a lot of ways. And uh, just I love seeing different guys now that are older, been gone for 10, 15 years and you see all the success they're having and, and you love it for them. You know, that's, uh, you know, because a lot of it started here. Coach, one thing that you you always talked about was serving the community right? With what you did with your foundation, uh, your work there at the children's hospital, and you always preach that 
to your players. Well, why was why was that so important to you? Because I, I feel like some coaches don't put that much emphasis on it the way that you did. Well, I think it's important to connect with your community. Uh, all these people fill our stadium, you know, every Saturday, 80 some thousand people and care about what you're doing. I mean, so to, to show care back uh, doesn't take a whole lot, um, you know, and then to me, it's, it's what you should do uh, to give back to your community in any way that you're able to, or, or, you know, and it, and it, and again, with me, I kind of found rather than trying to do it 18 different ways, I just stuck to the children's hospital and children's organizations in our area from Norman to Oklahoma City and found that path to be rewarding, but also really, um, you know, I, I just felt, you know, it was something special to me. And I was, and I found a lot of, I still to this day have a lot of really special relationships from people at the children's hospital and children that have been treated and cured and, uh, um, I got a beautiful tweet from her a month ago and she's telling me she had gone through two battles of, of cancer treatment, had really lost all of her teen years. And here she just got married and went to her wedding about two years ago. And here she's pregnant with twins. I just got that message a couple weeks ago. So I was, I was elated and I'll still find a way to meet her for lunch. And I, I, I've known her now probably, I bet at least 18 years since, uh, since I started, uh, you know, to see her in the children's hospital. Wow. So great, great relationships like that, that are really uh, rewarding uh, for me uh, as well. That's awesome. Oh, one more and we'll let you get out of here, coach. And I, I know you don't like to accept praise. So, um, but I was going to games. Uh, I was going to games. Uh, at OU in the, in the mid nineties, late nineties. And it wasn't going particularly well. And I, I said something uh, about this at your retirement celebration, but have you had that moment where you look at what the OU program is now, how this thing is rolling and you kind of take a step back and you say, you know what, maybe I didn't do it myself, but I helped save Oklahoma football because in my eyes you did. I, I know that sound that that's a lot, but that's how I see it, man. Well, I don't, I don't ever look at it. I look at very few things as me. Um, as I said, there's too many people involved in this. Um, now I might've been in front to orchestrate it all, but I had a ton of help. And so that's why I don't look at it as me, but um, I take pride in the consistency that we've had, you know, from 2000 to, to this year, I don't know that anyone has, has a better record overall, more consistent record and against uh, ranked teams as well. So, you know, all of that, you know, to me is you, you do take a lot of pride in, but I, I just don't accept things that are just me. I, I don't, uh, if I go out and, and I shoot even par in the Pebble Beach Pro-Am, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to go out on a football field and win, that's a whole bunch of people. And, and, and that's what I think even too many people focus on just the quarterback. You know, he, 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 he not going to do it himself. If he doesn't have a line or some receivers to throw it to or whatever, you know, you, you're, it takes, it takes everybody, you know, to, and I, I was lucky to smart enough to put together a good team of people around me. Well, uh, I think I speak for Ted as well when I say it was it was an absolute pleasure to play for you. And I could not be more fired up for you to be part of the 2021 College Football Hall of Fame class. You deserve it, man. I'm proud of you, Coach. Uh, thank you, Teddy and Gabe, both. I'm, I'm excited about it. I've gone to that banquet every year my entire coaching career. Um, so I've been to it about 19, 20 straight years. I only missed the, the last one I missed was because I was in the XFL, uh, team working and I couldn't go other than that. I've always gone just to show respect and appreciation for the coaches and players getting in and, and no one has more, you know, uh, respect for what we do as coaches. than I do being a son of a coach and being a lifelong coach, you know, it's demanding 
but very rewarding as well. So, but I'll, I'll be excited to be there. Hopefully we can be there next December. Start working on that speech. <laughs> well, you know, they only have one or two uh, that actually get up and talk. So I got my fingers crossed. And won't, won't be here. <laughs> what do you mean? They're going to make you speak. You're the most, not, not to disrespect any of the other guys, but you're the most accomplished guy in the class. Yeah. I got no, bad no, news no. for you. You're going to be up there. You're shit out of luck, man. I'm, I'm really lucky too. I'm going in with one of my teammates, Andre Tippett, who played 12 years for the Patriots. He is five, six time pro bowler. He was a first team uh, consensus all American at Iowa. And we were together on our big 10 championship Rose bowl team. So it'll be fun to go in with Andre as well. That's cool. Yeah. Coach right, guys. Bob Stoops, first ballot college Listen football hall of famer. All right, you boys are going in your first team, all Americans. Oh, Teddy, Teddy, I, I have already yeah. started the campaign. Teddy should be in already. It's ridiculous. He's not, I got no shot, which I'm fine with. I wasn't that good. I'm on the no, campaign he, against it. I'm, uh, I keep going. Got, <laughs> Teddy got the trophies to back it up. He'll be in. <laughs> Damn um, right. I'll come, All right. See, I'll come see it too, Teddy. I uh, will cheers to it. All right, All right coach. See it. That was awesome. That was awesome. Coach Stoops at his finest. Hall of Fame, man. Maybe the F Hall of Fame deal gave just calmed him down a little bit. Who knows? It it certainly opened him up a little bit. And yeah. I I will say this. At some point, I'm going to start a serious Teddy Lehman to the College Football uh, Hall of Fame. Like I, I'm going to start the campaign. I hope you know that because it is absolutely ridiculous that you're not in there yet. I think it is not ridiculous. Um <sighs> Don't start the campaign. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen, Gabe. No campaign necessary. Nothing wrong with a little nudge, <laughs> just a little nudge. And this is the way I look at it. It would be great content for the podcast. That's Eddie. true. Come on. That's true. I, I, okay. That makes sense for that. I will do it for the least, content, man. I will marginally uh, agree with you. Just, just barely. I'm going to do it. I'm going to start the campaign. You're going to be so <laughs> pissed at me. All right, let's move on to National College Football Roundup. That's brought to you by Tim Hughes Custom Homes. Are you looking to build your dream home? If so, Tim Hughes is the man you are looking for. Tim Hughes Custom Homes is a one-stop shop for all your home building needs. He can find you a lot. He can find you an architect. He'll find you financing. And of course, he can build your dream home exactly the way you want it. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, Tim found my wife and me a lot. He found us an architect and built our new house. Tim and his team were so easy to work with. He is still helping us when we have questions about things around the house. He's also built several office buildings. So if your business is looking to build a custom office, Tim Hughes is your man. You can see Tim's custom builds throughout Gallardia, Nichols Hills, Oak Tree, Stone Mill, and Rose Creek. It is a great time to build the house of your dreams. For more information to see Tim's spectacular work, visit his Instagram, Instagram page at Tim Hughes Custom Homes or visit Tim Hughes Custom Homes com. Okay, let's start with some news. Uh, out of Austin, Steve Sarkeesian taking a few guys from the Bama staff with him to Texas. He's taken the special teams coordinator, Jeff Banks, who has a lot of strong ties in the state of Texas. But the guy that stood out to me that he's bringing is Kyle Flood. Ted, that, that's the offensive line coach there at Bama. They, they ended up giving him the offensive coordinator title to, to bring him over. But Sark's still going to call the, call the plays, but Kyle Flood can coach, man. Uh, I, I watched a lot of Bama this year. He was able to get those talented offensive linemen to play with great technique and with great effort. It's not always easy to get top recruits to do that. And he did it at a very, very high level. When I look at the differences between OU and Texas over the last several years, I think the biggest differences have been quarterback play and offensive line play. And if Kyle Flood can recruit and develop offensive linemen at Texas, all of a sudden the gap between OU and Texas starts to close just a little bit. Now I'm not, I'm not worried. I'm cool. I'm cool. But this guy can coach and I wouldn't be surprised if Texas gets better on the offensive line with the talent he's going to be able to bring in because he's a great recruiter, but also just watching those kids from Bama, watching the technique they use, watching the way they finish blocks. Like 
this guy can coach. There's no doubt. Yeah. And I know both you and I agree that Sarkeesian, his run game and some of the stuff that he's built off of it, that uh, Alabama did is great. Um, And you got to have offensive linemen that can move though, in order to pull it off uh, the way you, you really want to and the way Alabama has. So they've got their work cut out for them. Now, there's been good athletes come through Texas quite a bit on the offensive line side. There's been some guys that have even been drafted high recently, even though I don't know that they ever really, you know, showed to me all that, that great uh, of an ability. You're talking so, about Connor Williams and no, I, I, I don't know why he was drafted so high. It didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Still doesn't make sense. And he has not played well for the Cowboys. So I feel vindicated yeah. in my opinion of him. Yeah. So, I mean, you feel like they'll be able to at least get some talent through there and, and coach them up a little bit. He is a really good coach. And I'm, I'm just curious how pissed off Nick Saban is uh, whenever he's taking these guys, because it's pretty well known that he doesn't like whenever people leave his staff. Uh, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. There's also been rumors that they may lose uh, Golding as defensive coordinator, but I don't know why you would leave defensive coordinator at Alabama for defensive coordinator at Texas, other than Nick Saban saying, Hey, you should probably take that Texas defensive coordinator job. Uh, But you know, I I don't know. I he's putting together what appears to be a pretty good staff. And that's always the most important job of a head coach is making sure your staff uh, is really good and solid. And it looks like they're doing that. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of Nick Saban, you mentioned probably not happy that he's having to replace so many guys, but he's definitely used to having to replace guys on his staff. He's already gotten started. Bill O'Brien going to be the next offensive coordinator there at Bama. I haven't seen anything that's made it like official official, but yeah. it, it's been swirling for so long that uh, I can't imagine that that's not the case. And Teddy, it's pretty wild to think that a guy that was not only a head coach, but also a general manager in the NFL is now going to be an offensive coordinator for Nick Saban. I guess it's not that weird because it it seems like he is always the guy that gets all the fired head coaches and just collects them and rehabilitates their image and they all get great jobs again. But it, it is interesting that a guy that had that much power in the national football league is now going to be taking orders from Nick Saban. I can't wait for the dynamic on that sideline next season. It's going to be awesome. Well, thank God the personnel decisions are not left up to him. Oh, boy. Um, not a Saban's, good GM. Yeah. That, I mean, I, he, he's good as a play caller. I'm fascinated to see, you know, because it's interesting to go from, from college to pro and then from pro back to college. Uh, you know, I wonder what advantage that gives you, maybe disadvantage. I don't know. I think, I think it's interesting, you know, Sarkeesian, whenever he went from college to the pros there at Atlanta, uh, did a good job, but it seemed like whenever he came back to Alabama, like he had maybe something a little bit different about him. And I wonder if that's going to be the same thing with Bill O'Brien. If you could take some of those principles from the NFL back to college and kind of elevate whatever offense you're in charge of. So it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to see how it's going to work. He's going to have great players. So I imagine it's going to work well, but we'll see it better happen quickly because he's going to be under the microscope there with Saban. Yeah. I hope they fist fight. That would be great. It would be very entertaining. I I agree with you. I think Bill O'Brien's a good play caller. I I think he's going to be a good coordinator. It's going to be similar to what we saw from Sarkeesian, little different style, but uh, the guy can call plays. He he's had so many great jobs for a reason. It's because he's a gifted offensive mind. And now that he can just focus on that and not trying to be the general manager and everything that comes with that, this is just be the play caller, just be the offense coordinator. I, I think it'll be great. And he's going to have Bama's players. So that that's always a good place to start. Okay, a lot of college football stars have declared for the draft. Started Alabama, Mac Jones, Jalen Waddell, 
Christian Barmore after that just Huge dominant, game. dominant national championship game from him. And then Patrick Sertan, all declared for the draft. No surprise there, Ted. All, all of, I would say all of them probably going in the first round, right? I guess, what, Mac Jones, maybe the the last one drafted out of that group? Yeah. And, I mean, that's not all of them either. I think Najee Harris is a first-rounder now. Maybe Devontae Smith, Najee back. Harris, those four guys. So they got at least six first-rounders. I think so. That's that's the way I've looked at it is six first-rounders and maybe a couple of guys that, that aren't there. I mean, I I was shocked to see that some people didn't have Leatherwood, Leatherwood. in the first round. I mean, you love Leatherwood, and so do I. I do. We watched a lot of them. He can move, man. He's he can move. So I don't know. I so it could be. There's going to be a bunch of them. <laughs> oh well, and then the Dickerson kid. I mean, sometimes the center goes in the first round. If he's the first center off the board, could be eight. Yeah, yeah. Ridiculous, I mean, man. They're, they're going to have eight in the first two rounds for sure, without a doubt. Probably I would bet my life eight. on them having eight in the first two rounds. It's probably going to be eight in the first forty-five picks. It's you know, casual. Yeah. Crazy. Okay. Clemson. Crazy. Travis Etienne announced he is headed to the draft, which is no surprise. It was more surprising last year when he said he was coming back, but set all kinds of records. Awesome career there for the Tigers. But Clemson, while they're losing Etienne, they did get some great news that Justin Ross will be returning to the team in 2021. If you forgot, remember, he missed all of 2020 with that spinal condition. Now I'm not a doctor or anything, but anytime it has to do with your spine, not great. It, it, that's not a great situation, but let's not forget how talented this kid was the two seasons before that. Uh, I mean, their top receiver in 2019, this guy is all of six, four looks the part, absolute stud. Uh, and this is huge for Clemson, but also Huge for DJ Uyunglele, right? You, when you have that top target coming back, like that's that makes the quarterback's life much easier, especially when you're stepping in to fill the shoes of Trevor Lawrence. Yeah. Well, whenever they first found this condition that he had, I mean, the news then was that he's not ever going to be able to play again. Um, you know, and it's it's good that he's been able to work his way back. It's probably good, you know the medical issues in the draft are that's the most difficult for teams because a lot of teams, whenever you see guys that you would consider for lack of a better term, damaged goods, it, you're making a big risk drafting those guys with a high pick. So for him to put as much time and snaps between, you know, the draft and that diagnosis, I think is huge. If he can show that, he can stay healthy. It's not a factor, and he's going to be 100%. I think that's a good thing. But, yeah, there's no doubt that this helps Clemson in that offense. And a new quarterback having a 6'4", uh, unbelievable target to throw to, that calms your nerves a little bit for sure. Yeah, that kid's a stud. It, it's going to be really great seeing him back out on the field. Just what Clemson needs, another tall, awesome wide receiver. Yeah. Great. Congrats, <laughs> guys. Okay, uh, last one. Trey Sermon he is declared for the draft. Uh, we'll see if he's healthy enough to play in the Senior Bowl. Uh, I, I don't really know. Never really got a final word on if it was the collarbone, the shoulder, you know, kind of what happened to him on that first carry of the national championship game. But what a career for this guy. I mean, was tremendous for OU. Uh, gave that Ohio State team life late this season. And I, I was looking it up. Kuyper's got him as the number three running back on his board. Wow. And I, wow. I, we always talk about kids transferring and sometimes we wonder why. And this is a classic example. And maybe he would have been up. He would have had a great year if he would have stayed at OU. Right. And, and he would have been in this exact same spot, but it, it is hard to argue that Trey Sermon did not make the right decision for him because now he's <laughs> he's supposed to be the third running back going in the draft. Now, Kuiper's not always very accurate with that stuff, but that's that's pretty great for him, man. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any doubt. Um, it's interesting. I, he's kind of a he, – he's not bad catching the, the football, but it's not really what you would call his specialty. 
And I know this guy was unbelievable in college and ended up being a, a, a really high pick, but he kind of reminds me of a Fournette a little bit. Uh, physical, uh, can run over you, has some pretty good speed, maybe better than you would expect for his size, but not really going to be a guy that's featured in the passing game like a Kamara or a, I mean, a, most of the most of the top backs in the league that uh, McCaffrey, those type of guys. So um, not that he's a one trick pony, but I think he's definitely more of a physical runner type of back. So, I mean, if, if that's right, and he's the third back off the board. That's a probably a second mid mid second, late second, early third type of designation there, which is still crazy to me to think about used to, if you were the third back taken, you'd be a first rounder. Yeah. So no, there's no doubt. So yeah, we'll, we'll see, like you're saying, second, third round at the worst. Now it, it'd be great for, if, for him, if he could go play at the senior bowl, but I, I, I just don't know where he's at health wise as that event gets closer yeah. and closer. All right, Ted, let's move on to our winners and losers of the weekend NFL divisional playoffs edition. Teddy's winners and losers are brought to you by advanced weight loss clinic of sand Springs. They'll help you execute a realistic and achievable weight loss plan designed for you and only you. They've got all kinds of treatments for men and women. They're licensed and trained experts combine diet and exercise with hormone therapies to maximize your results. If you're struggling with low libido or low energy, advanced weight loss clinic of sand Springs can help with that too. They also also offer Botox and fillers to get on the path to losing weight. Call 918-241-LOSE or visit their Facebook page. If you mention the podcast, you will get a free fat burner injection. Okay, Ted, who do you have as your winner of the weekend? Uh, my winner of the weekend is Stefan Diggs. And here's the reason. I I think it's amazing what he's done there. Remember, he was traded from Minnesota to Buffalo. Um, he's I remember fantastic. Stefan Diggs well. I was on the Saints for the Minneapolis Miracle game. I, ah. I'm, I'm very familiar with Stefan Diggs, unfortunately. Okay. Well, you know, whenever this trade was announced, it was basically a, oh my God, what a terrible trade. Uh, Buffalo is getting Stefan Diggs. He's not going to fit in with their offense. I want you to read this or listen to this fantasy projection from from whenever this trade happened it's on his espn bio i was looking to see what his statistics were Diggs was traded to buffalo during the offseason and will now operate as the bill's top target the 26 year old posted a trio of top 25 campaigns during his final three season in minnesota but now moves to a low volume run first buffalo offense led by the inefficient and scramble heavy josh josh allen that figures to lead to a decrease in production for Diggs, which is a concern considering he was only the 24th wide receiver last season, despite Kirk Cousins' extremely efficient campaign with Adam Thielen's sideline. Diggs, who has never appeared in all 16 games of a regular season, is likely to be an overdrafted is un, is likely to be overdrafted and is best viewed as only a wide receiver number three. And I think oh. it's awesome just to think about this guy and what a lot of people thought of that trade. And, oh, my God, why would he want to go to Buffalo? Why would they – Buffalo, they're not going to ever get anything done. He just goes out and catches 127 balls in the regular season, number one in the NFL, for over 1,500 yards, number one in the NFL, goes to the playoff, wins a couple of playoff games, uh, is the number, the, the leading receiver. I mean, it's just fantastic what he's done. And honestly, I love Allen and I like Buffalo and their defense, but that team is not what they are without Stefan Diggs. I completely agree with that. I think that, and they talked about it a lot on the broadcast. It seems like him and Josh Allen really like each other. I mean, there was a lot of this stuff going around on Twitter afterwards. Like, I saw that. Get, get someone that looks at you the way that Josh Allen looks at Stephon Diggs, right? Yeah. And you're right, man. He's been fantastic for them. And sometimes it just takes a change of scenery, right? And he was good in Minnesota. Like, don't get me wrong, but he is great. I mean, he's arguably 
the best wide receiver in the National Football League. I mean, yeah. who looked better than him this weekend? I mean, and he can do everything. He's great on short balls. You can throw a bubble to him and let him go to work after the catch. Uh, he's obviously a burner and is a great deep ball target. He's a great route runner. And, you know, for whatever reason, I, I don't know why the situation in Minnesota was so weird for him to where he was acting out and disgruntled at times because he looks as happy as could be and locked in and focused with that football team. He's in a great place right now. Just he he's the perfect weapon for a guy like Josh Allen. Cause I mean, you can, you, the faster, the better, because Josh Allen can throw it longer than the field is, uh, you know, so get you a guy that's a burner and let him try and run under some of those balls. So I, I think he's great. There's, there's only one answer to why he was unhappy in Minnesota and that's, he had to have just hated Kirk Cousins like that, right? Like he, Which I could see that I, I could see Kirk Cousins as a guy that really means well, but rubs a bunch of people the wrong way. Just wasn't vibing with Kirk Cousins' heavy dad energy. I guess I I, I don't know I don't know, but he's you're right. He is balling in Buffalo. All right, who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Well, I mean, I I put this down before the saints and bucks game was over uh because i was going to say whoever has to travel to green bay is the loser now credit uh tampa bay for winning the football game uh did a great job but green bay is going to be like 12 degrees next weekend and snowing and both of these teams are coming from that dome Tampa's been nice and comfortable playing in the South all year. And I know Brady played in the cold up in New England for a long time. But if you've ever lived up north and gotten acclimated to that and then moved south, like it's gone like that. And I'm telling you, that place is going to be a frozen tundra. And here's the other thing. I think, tell me what you think here, because I think Buffalo was the same way. I think these stadiums are louder when they're not full because they echo with all the concrete. Have you heard Ooh. how loud it is? Okay. So a couple of those games, like Buffalo, like the Buffalo and Baltimore game sounded loud as hell. Yeah. And green Bay was the same way. And they only had, okay. Light. Any physicists or acoustic experts, let us know if Teddy's theory has any merit it, it can it be louder because all the sound is bouncing off all the concrete. Let us know. I don't know because if the announcers are like, Oh my God, it's incredible. Uh, now maybe they've just got that mic, the crowd mic like blaring, but I don't know. I think it's at least interesting. You see the guys, they can hear it out there and they're getting the crowd into it, but um, weather crowd. And yeah, also that offense at green Bay is going to be something too. Who boy. They looked good. My winners and losers are brought to you by Sound Advice. A lot of us are watching football, our favorite football teams from home this year, which is why you need to get ready for game day with a home theater system from our friends at Sound Advice. Sound Advice can customize your home entertainment system indoors or outdoors. Sound Advice did the Wi-Fi network and all the audio visual at my new house, and it is awesome. They hide all the wires and the cable boxes so it looks great, and I can control every TV in my house from my phone, and my Wi-Fi has been flawless for the best home theater systems in the Oklahoma City area, call Sound Advice at 405-549-3880 or visit soundadviceokc.com. Okay, got a couple winners. First one, I was watching the Baltimore-Buffalo game and I was like, okay, maybe the Buffalo defense is the winner of this game or maybe it's the wind or both maybe, but I kind of was leaning towards the wind because it looked miserable, but... That game, uh, I mean, er, it, it, it was just awful. It was beautifully horrific, and I, I, I'm not going to lie. I felt a little bad for the kickers. <laughs> they just kept showing the goalposts just, like, blowing. It, it, was, uh, it was pretty awful, but even though it was wind-aided, the Buffalo defense, they, they were good in the red zone, and they held Lamar Jackson and the Ravens to three points. Teddy, any time you hold a team to three 
you had a good night and they had the pick six, right? That's, that's something to be very excited about. If you're a Buffalo fan, I thought that defense played well. They played really well. Yeah, they did two quick win stories. Um, when I was in Buffalo, the last game of the year, we played new England and I'm not kidding. It was, it was probably in the mid twenties and the wind, the, it was gusting up to like 70 miles an hour that day. So like whenever you're standing on the sideline, like you're braced, like with one leg back to where you could even stand up without getting blown over and new England kicked a field goal from like the 15 yard line. It was a close field goal and it went up went in, in between the uprights and then like went around the right upright and came back onto the field and it was good. It never hit the net. <laughs> <laughs> and they also there, I'm trying to remember who their opponent was, but he was standing in deep in his own end zone, caught the ball, punted it. And I mean, he hit it really good. Don't get me wrong, but it was going like a hundred miles an hour hit once on the other 20 and bounced into like the stands at beyond the end zone. That's how hard the wind was blowing. <laughs> it was the craziest. Thing. It was like watching a rocket. So I know what the wind gets like in Buffalo. It's brutal. It is. Uh, there were some practices when I was in Buffalo where, you know, some, the, the person in practice, like, right. You have the equipment guy that's spotting the ball. Like he'd have to stand there with his feet around the ball <laughs> so that it didn't go rolling because the wind would just blow it across the field. It, oh, Buffalo. Love you. Great place though. Okay. My other winner of the weekend, people that want the fumbling through the end zone rule to be changed because <laughs> my God, do they have a big play to point to now because dirty Dan Sorensen lowers the boom on Richard Higgins, forced him to fumble through the end zone. And I assume that everyone except for Teddy and you sick defensive people like him think it's the dumbest rule in football. Oh, I, I mean, that, that did change that game. Now Cleveland yeah. still had their chances and I, I'm not sure they should have punted there on that, but it was fourth and nine and Chad Henney was the quarterback instead of Mahomes. Thank God they had him in a third and 15 or whatever. Third and 15 and Chad Henney just turns out he turns the jets on. I was like, wait, Chad Hitty can run. He's old. Yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, I wonder what Mahomes. Um, okay. That was uh, okay. So you, I've had my fair share of concussions. I'm sure you have too. It's not fun, but that was such a, it looked like such a harmless hit. And I almost thought that he had like gotten choked or something, you know, like when someone, you know, back when you're a kid, you're messing around, your older brother like chokes you and you get a little woozy, like, and you stumble a little bit. Like I was hoping that was going on, but that's the weird thing about concussions, man. You, you really yeah. don't know. Yeah. I, so I agree because it looked like the guy, whenever he came to tackle him, he like brings the arm and it goes right across his neck. And my thought was, I wonder if he like hit his neck so hard that it like, I don't know, maybe cut off blood flow or something just for maybe a moment. That's what I was or, thinking. Like he blacked out for a second because yeah. like, you know, there wasn't enough oxygen or blood, something getting to his brain. Yeah, it was weird. And I don't know, maybe that guy caught him on the jaw whenever he clubbed down because it didn't look like his helmet ever really hit anything. But yeah, and, I know he got hit pretty hard by that the force of that guy's forearm coming in. Yeah, and you're you're right. It didn't look like his head. Did, some people are like his head hit the ground. I was like, no, it did. Like his head, his helmet didn't even hit the ground. And you know, most concussions come on like some sort of whiplash, right? You you get that whiplash. Now sometimes mm -hmm. the whiplash, you hit your head on the ground as well. Like we saw that with Lamar Jackson. Ooh, that was textbook whiplash. Hit your head on the turf, and you're not feeling too hot, but. The, that Mahomes thing, it was scary too, because like that look in his eye and yeah. you know the way he was staggering, I was like, oh boy, that well, uh, in. At first, I thought it was his foot because I'm telling you right now, that's the other thing I was going to talk about is he's going to have turf toe. And have you ever had turf toe? No, but I've heard oh guys, I've seen guys cry from it. It is 
it is brutal and it takes forever to go away. And so I thought that he was just like hurting his foot from that earlier. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Do. And that's and then I saw like, the look his on his head's face. Okay. Yeah. If his head's okay and they pass him through for, uh, concussion protocol, I bet he's still going to be hobbled pretty hard. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know how the NFL concussion protocol works, it, it takes five days. So we won't really know anything until probably Saturday. And I assume that he will play. I, I really hope he'll play, but man, that was, oof. I will say this about that game. Andy Reed must transport his testicles in a wheelbarrow because what a <laughs> ballsy call at the end of the game. Oh my gosh. That was crazy. That little, um, that play action. Now I wanted to ask you back cause we didn't even talk about it. Sorry. I, I brought up the Mahomes still, but the play where the ball gets jarred loose as he's reaching for the pylon. So I want to make something clear. I didn't have a problem with the hit. I know a lot of people were making, and I know he led with the crown of his helmet and, but when two guys are running full speed and diving, I, I mean, what, what's he supposed to do? That's my question. I guess uh, like, what's he supposed to leave lead with when he is diving full speed? Like, yeah. Was he supposed to like Superman, like, and put his arms out? Like, I don't understand. That's why I like, hate the rule yeah. because the rule can be called on every single play. Anytime, anytime someone catches the ball or running back is running with the ball, it's almost impossible to tackle someone without leading with your helmet in some form or fashion. They're also supposed to call it on ball carriers that lead with the crown of their helmet. And I've never seen them call that. So my problem with it is it's only used in certain situations. It's not used to the letter of the law. And that kind of pisses me off, but I wanted to ask you because I've never been in an offensive meeting where they're talking about this. Now it's a, it's a rule that, a lot of people that casually watch football don't know, but it does come into play. And it's usually, you know, not until it's a big deal like this, that people get all bent out of shape. What's the typical conversation with, with offensive coaches and guys putting that ball out there to reach for that pylon, because there's no more, you, you wouldn't think it, but it's the riskiest play in all of football because you're right there. You're on a chance to score a touchdown in great field position. And if you fumble that ball, even if they don't recover it and you're just outstretched, it's just, it's touchback and it's, it's just a brutal rule. So how was that coached? A lot of coaches say, don't reach the ball out unless it's fourth down. Right. A bit like, don't reach it out like that unless you absolutely have to. Because the exact scenario we just saw play out in the Chiefs Browns game can happen. So that's how it was taught to us at OU. I mean, whether it was Kevin Wilson or Heupel, hey, don't reach it out unless it's fourth down. Don't reach it out. Like it was just hammered into like ball security, ball security. But the NFL, you know how it is, Ted. Like it, it gets a little different. Like, Guys are reaching the ball. Like they have contract incentives when it comes, score, man. Yeah. when it comes to scoring touchdowns, like there, there's money on the line, but yeah, you, you think you're making the, like, I'm sure Richard Higgins thought he was making the right play there, but if he doesn't do that, do they probably score in the next couple of plays? Yeah, probably. So that's like the coaching point. And I know, I know coaches across the country are going to use that clip for the next several years going, don't reach it out unless it's fourth down because that's what can happen. That's how a lot of coaches teach it. And yeah. they just drill it into you. Well, I know it's a controversial rule. Um, I like the rule. I, I'm shocked. I think, shocked. Well, I mean, I like a, a sport where details matter. And I like the fact that a guy who it's a sure touchdown he doesn't give up on the play. He goes and tries to cap the guy off and separate him from the football and ends up making what I consider to be a game winning play. I think details matter. I think it's a game of inches and stuff like this is what separates 
you know, sometimes the, the teams that are disciplined from the teams that aren't. And I'm not going to sit here and say that it's an undisciplined play necessarily, but if you're coached to not reach for the pylon unless it's fourth down, then don't reach for the pylon unless it's fourth down or it's an absolute sure thing. So I, I like it. It's, it's a brutal rule, man. It's brutal. Um, and it, I know that this is not a new rule that they bring up in the competition committee because like whenever I played in the UFL, um, my coach, Jim Fossil, was, he coached the Giants. I mean, they were all NFL guys. And whenever they sat down and talked about the rules, this is the rule that they changed. And I believe in that league, if you fumbled the ball through the end zone, you got it on the one yard line. So, see, I wouldn't I mean, want it to be that. I, I think there maybe should it was be the spot of the fumble or something like that. I, I don't, I don't remember what it was okay. exactly. And I, I, I hear hear what you're saying with attention to detail, and you, you know how. I feel about all that stuff. I, I agree with that. The rule's the rule. But if they did change it, what do you think would be reasonable to you? I, I, I thought that how about if you fumble it through the end zone, it, it goes to whatever next down it is, but you get the ball on the 15-yard line. So, like, say it's first down, you run a play, you die for the pylon, it goes through the end zone then it's second and goal from the 15, your thoughts. So it'd be um, like, it's basically like a 15 yard penalty for the offense. Think of it that way. Yeah. I get Would you it. be okay with that? No, because it doesn't make any sense to me. I know what you're like, what you're saying makes sense. I, I'm saying if but, they were to change it, they would have right. the offense would have to keep the ball somehow. I, I, I guess. would say, I would say that because here's the thing, um, like how long of a play was that? Because I still think that that was a long play. Right. And I still think that you would get massive benefits from that. So if I was to change it, I would say the defense gets the ball. It's a touchback, but they get it where the fumble occurred. So in this case, the Chiefs would have got the ball, but they would have got it on the half-yard line. First down, half-yard line coming out. It, because that way, they don't anything get... Anything makes more sense than the current rule. I, right. I would be on board for that. Sure. It still, still punishes to... the offense, but it's better than them getting it at the 20. Right. you got to be able to punish the offense for fumbling, and you've got to be able to reward the other team by at least giving them the football, but they're going to be usually all they're going to be able to do is, you know, run a sneak, run a play, probably end up punting it out of their own end zone. So I don't know. I think that would be a good compromise. Yeah. I'm with you. All right. My loser of the weekend, Drew Brees, man, who just could not throw the ball down the field. Uh, they they brought in Jameis for the trick play, right? And he just throws a beautiful bomb. But Breeze had three interceptions in his last game in the Superdome. And it it just sucks watching one of the legends of the game go out that way. And, you know, I played with Breeze just for a couple of weeks when I was in New Orleans. And he is the definition of a true professional. Like, the, the guy – thought about winning and what he could do to help the team. It seems like every second of every day, that's what he was thinking about, of how he could improve, how he could put the team in a position to win games. And it, it, it just, it just sucked watching him look that way in his last game, man. Uh, that, that was just unfortunate. Yeah. It's rare. I mean, and it's not just football. It's any sport. It's rare that you're able to go out on top, right off into the sunset. It's usually you you hang around a little too long until until you can't really cut it anymore, and um, it it kind of slams you in the in the face that you're done. I mean, winning the Super Bowl like Peyton Manning did is not. I mean, that's that's not how it usually. You mean like happens. the Broncos defense did? Yeah, like yes. Uh, so you hate to see it, but 
you know, they still had a nice season. It was a brutal year. You know, he had to fight through injury, a lot of it. So I hated to see him go out on, God, what did it end up being? Three, three interceptions three. that he threw. Yeah. Um, you hate that stat line for the guy. He's been fantastic. I mean, he's he's going to be – him and Brady are right there neck and neck for all the all-time records. So, I don't know what's – I don't know what the future holds for them. But um, that throw by Jameis Winston has people like, ooh, let's go. Let's go. Be it's careful gonna, what you wish for. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see who the next quarterback there in New Orleans is. Oh, one other loser, Aaron Donald. And don't get me wrong, the guy's amazing. He's still amazing, but he was obviously hurt in that game. But as I watched him, I feel like he just experienced what it's like to be just a guy for the first time. Now, once again, he was injured, but he just couldn't affect the game like he's used to. And he didn't take it particularly well, right? Now the, the personal foul, like saw the frustration in the game. And then as the game was coming to an end, you saw him crying on the sideline. And it's obviously because guys put a ton into it and it meant a lot to him. But also I think part of that frustration and that emotion was that he knows the game would have been different if he was healthy. It probably made him so sad to feel like the rest of us for one day and he, he just couldn't hold it in. But man, that, that had to suck for him experiencing what it's like to be human instead of uh, a cyborg. Is it? Rookie of the year with a kid breaks his arm and Roland Godna. Yeah, and, <laughs> it's kind of like that whenever he steps on the ball and jars his arm loose and, and loses his special talent. And he has like, to oh throw the God, floater. What am I going to do now? Yeah. I've, it's whatever uh, any superhero loses their powers for a second. Finds yeah, out it's his mom's the, glove. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the, to the real world, Aaron Donald. So, yeah, I mean, that was, I know that was incredibly frustrating for him. And it's also got to be frustrating in a sense because he plays a position in which a lot of times there's, there's really nothing a defensive coach can do for you to help you in getting some better situations, some better, you know, uh, one-on-ones. They're, they're really kind of limited other than moving you to the outside. So um, it was a frustration for him, but if I know him, he's going to come back uh, even better than ever next year. Yeah. Everyone should be very afraid. All <laughs> right, Ted, let's finish up with the return of football guys talking <laughs> basketball. FGTB is back. Let's go. It's brought to you by Bishop McGinnis Catholic high school. Bishop McGinnis Catholic high school has a long tradition of educational excellence they know that children need to be in school and are doing everything possible to make that happen. Bishop McGinnis students were welcomed back last August and saw very few interruptions in 2020 with a 12 to 1 student to student student to teacher. Jeez. 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio. No student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis's college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, Contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. Now, we're going to, when we do FGTB, we try to keep it to the local hoops, uh, even though James Harden somehow looking significantly skinnier in only five days is probably the biggest story in basketball right now and having a 30 something point triple double for the Nets. That was, that was pretty impressive. But we're going to keep then it spinning the knife on his old team by saying, yeah, it's amazing. The difference whenever you play with good players, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, they did there. I watched some of that game on game pass and oh my gosh, Durant and him together. The, there were some possessions where I was just like, this is awesome to watch, but we're going to focus on, you know, OU Oklahoma state and the thunder when we do FGTB. So Bedlam basketball, Postponed. So it was supposed to be Saturday, but Oklahoma State is having some Rona problems. And that's unfortunate, Ted, because a lot of people, including myself, were really excited for that game. I just wanted to watch Cade Cunningham some more. That's it. Yeah. I mean, I 
hopefully we get to replay that and it's probably going to be at the end of the year and i think it may end up being possibly back-to-back games if they do that so uh yeah i mean because i think that game is going to ultimately be incredibly important for both oklahoma and oklahoma state when it comes to making the tournament yeah and it it seems like ou's you know it's just such a weird year with the postponements and having guys in and out of the lineup. It's kind of hard to really judge these teams at this point. I don't know if we'll ever really have a full grasp of what these teams look like with the interruptions that are going to continue to happen in college basketball. I, there was one really cool thing. Did you see the thing that Oklahoma state basketball put? They had a, they gave one of the walk-ons a scholarship. They met him at, he, he works at Walmart. And they met him there and like surprised him and told him he had a scholarship. Mike Boynton did. It was awesome. Oh, uh, that's pretty cool. I didn't see that. That's awesome. Yeah, he's working his way through school at Walmart, you know, paying for school. Uh, he was walk on and they put him on scholarship. It was pretty that's damn awesome. cool. Uh okay, Thunder News. Well, the Thunder 76ers got postponed. They were warming up and all of a sudden the game was off because of a contact tracing issue with the 76ers. So really the only game we can talk about for the thunder is the one that happened on Friday night. And that was a big comeback win right down 20 something points there in the second half. They end up winning in overtime against the bulls on Friday. Teddy, be honest. Are you even watching the Oklahoma city thunder games right now? Are you watching them? I'm not watching all of them. I watched a lot of this one, but I was like, ah, they're not coming back. And I, uh, I turned that one off, but yes, I've been watching the thunder. I haven't caught every single game. Um, you know, whenever Monday, the college football season ended, I was able to up my basketball, um, watching and whenever the NFL ends, I'll be able to give it even more attention. It's hard for me to spread. I've got just a little bit of brain power. So it's hard to spread it over multiple sports, but yes, Gabe, I have been watching the OKC Thunder. Gosh, just think this is going to be a basketball podcast in no time. Yes. We're gonna be ho- we're gonna be hoops guys. Yeah, right. No, but we're gonna be it, Nets guys is what we're gonna be probably. Uh, uh. It's gonna be brutal. I'm gonna be so pissed off. You know how I feel about the Harden trade, okay? If you're not a fan, that team. If Durant and James Harden go to the finals or win a championship, I may have a mental breakdown. Now, if any of you are confused, he is not talking about the Harden trade that just happened. The he is talking Thunder uh, trade. He is talking about the 2013, <laughs> 13, 12, 12, 12. It was still 12. No, dude, you were trying to focus on uh, blocking Manti Teo. I don't think I touched him once that entire game. Not not a great game plan when the uh, center doesn't <laughs> touch the middle linebacker, Ted. That's not what you're after. <laughs> but so, uh, yes, Teddy is scarred by the hardened thunder trade. So let's hope that the Nets don't mm. accomplish much or else our man Ted may, uh, may have some issues, guys. Okay, but that game on Friday night, I will say this. I watched every second of it, and I, I – was sitting there in the third quarter going, why am I still watching this? And I do like watching the team because you know they have so many young pieces. And even when it's garbage time, like those guys are still getting minutes. And I, I like to see how those guys react when they get those minutes. It's similar to kind of how I like to see when football players, like the way that they play in a blowout, Like, I like to see the effort they play with. I I think you can learn some things about guys in those moments. And I'll say this. The Bulls made a comical amount of errors late in that basketball game uh, to to give the Thunder a chance. But the most encouraging thing I saw in that game is the emotion I saw from Shea Gilgis-Alexander. And he he is a guy that he's kind of been soft-spoken, but – seems like over these last couple of weeks is really starting to open up and embrace that leadership role for that team. And I'm not going to lie. I had some doubts about him after the playoffs last year. I, I just really didn't like what I saw from him, especially, especially from a physicality standpoint, but 
now he looks stronger. He's finishing through contact. He has a lot better what I like to call contact balance at the rim, at and around the rim, where he is able to absorb contact from defenders and still stay on balance and finish with a variety of shots at the rim. But the most exciting part is, man, it looked like the dude was having fun. Looked like he was he was kind of getting his team going with his emotion. And I like seeing that. If that is the guy that the franchise is going to build around, and he's starting to look like that type of player to me. He still needs to improve his shooting. There's no doubt about it. But he's really getting good around the rim, uh, getting to the free throw free throw line a little more. So I I'm start I'm starting to be an SGA believer, like an SGA believer as in like a franchise type player. I think he's, he's going to be flirting with an all-star berth this year, Ted. Yeah. I think he's, the question is, is he good enough to, to be a franchise player or is he a guy that is just good and is kind of trade bait? You let him go out, you play well and use him as like deadline type of trade stuff. And I think I'm with you that he's he he looks to me like he's a good enough piece, young enough piece that he may be he may be one of those that you want to hit your wagon to. I'm curious to see what you know with with George Hill and Horford there, like what that does to his the leadership of that team. Is is he viewed as the guy, even though he's still a, a younger guy? Has that kind of stunted his growth a little bit, or uh, does everyone kind of know their role with what's going on now and know that he's going to be the guy in the future and kind of stand aside and let him take the reins? I wish I knew what that that dynamic was like a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, George Hill seems like the classic veteran leader, not too outspoken, kind of like the lead by example type guy. Uh, I guarantee you Al Horford's not deferring leadership to Shea Gilgis Alexander, but those guys have been in the league so long, like they, they know how it works. So it, it's crazy to think, you know, we're talking about Shea Gilgis Alexander, like he's some, you know, 25 year old guy. The dude is 22 years old. Yeah. 22. So it's nuts. Uh, the thunder have won more games than a lot of people hope they were going to I win. Know. That's <laughs> the funny thing. It's like they came back and won the game, but it's like, what are we doing guys? <laughs> is this, are we sure we want to do this? But I mean, it's still, I, you talked about this. It's still, I'm the same way. It's impossible to root for my team to lose. Can't it's do impossible. it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I refuse. So uh, the Thunder have the same record as the eight seed, which is the golden state warriors who are six and six, the Thunder. Six and six. What's happening here is the Thunder are playing good enough to back up in the draft and let someone else jump on the grenade and take the bad pick. That looks like the can't miss. That's what's that's what we have to say here is happening. That's exactly yes, Teddy. <laughs> that is exactly what's happening. And on that note, episode 78 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop Thursday morning. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 2 to 6 on Sports Talk 1400, and you can hear me from 3 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio Channel 375. Hope you all have a great weekend. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening, and do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.